going to hear from some experts. You know, going back to work has changed for everybody and everybody has a different approach. We're gonna learn about some science today. We're gonna learn from our area leaders and we're super excited that you're here. Uh, just a, a few technical things. So uh, if everybody during our event today, keep your mics muted, feel free to chat. If you have any questions, if we have time in the end, uh, Kara Matheson is going to be leading our amazing discussion today. And if we do have time, we can uh, also follow those chats. So think about some questions as we're going through our, uh, our amazing meeting today. This is our first toolkit event of the year. And we are gonna be talking about some deep topics that matter to our citizens, our West Des Moines community. And so we hope you join us for these series of events sponsored by Security National Bank and all of our events this year. We had two fabulous events last week and uh, I hope you were able to attend. Lots of buzz. If you weren't, go to our YouTube channel and you can see any event that we've done since COVID. They are all being taped and recorded. So smile big for the camera. You are on candid camera. So, uh, but uh, some amazing events today. So I'm excited to introduce our chamber team. Bailey First is running our Zoom meeting today. She's our Zoom master. The amazing Kara Matheson is gonna be guiding our conversation today. Anna Dowd is going to be leading us into our discussion and, and we're gonna learn more about our sponsor today. Thank you, Ray Meister for being here. And Nicole Langmaid is our amazing accounting leader and she keeps us running like a smooth steering ship that we are. So excited that you're all here. I am going to introduce Anna Dowd and Anna is our Director of Membership and Strategic Partnerships and she will introduce our sponsor today. Thanks, Anna. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. And good morning, everyone. We are so excited to have Security National Bank back with us again this year as a presenting sponsor for our business toolkit series. So huge thank you to Ray Meister and your team for supporting this program. And with that, I will hand the virtual mic over to you, Ray. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Catherine, and all the rest of the staff of the West Des Moines Chamber for everything you do, not only for our membership, but for our businesses. Um, as Anna indicated, I'm Ray Meister with Security National Bank. I am the uh, local market president for Security National. We are a uh, billion dollar uh, 14 location bank holding company that's headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska. We have uh, our two newest locations, one of which I reside in on uh, South Jordan Creek Parkway in West Des Moines. And uh, our newest location, which opened in the middle of the pandemic uh, last year in the month of June is in downtown Dallas, Texas. So we've got Nebraska, Iowa and Dallas, Texas covered. We are a community bank, uh, support our local customers and business, uh, small businesses, high net worth individuals, very strong in, in wealth and trust management. And we have a very extensive um, 401k management uh, team that deals with 401k investments for all of the businesses around. On behalf of the bank, thank you to the chamber and to all of you attendees for giving me a couple minutes this morning. We are deep in the throes, as most of you would might imagine, of PPP. We are calling it round three because technically uh, we had two rounds in 2020, but more importantly, uh, PPP 2021, it is uh, opened up for a few more businesses, and I would strongly encourage all of you, as it relates to any of your businesses, to go to the website www.sba.gov for some of the uh, specific uh, guidelines and qualification rules uh, related to your, your business or industry. Um, just a few of the general guidelines. The maximum loan amount this around is $2 million. 
you must be a company that employs 300 or fewer folks. And if you did get money in last year's PPP round, you either have had to spend that or intend to spend that all before the end of the March deadline. You must, if it is your second round, you must be able to indicate that you had one quarter in 2020 where your revenues were declined by greater than 25% for that comparable quarter in 2019. Um, if by chance you're a NAIX code 72, you have the opportunity to get three and a half times your uh, average monthly salary. And the reason for that is most of the NAIX code 72s our entertainment facilities, our restaurants, and those type of things that were drastically impacted uh, due to COVID last year. And they've opened it up for a little more funding availability for those organizations. Other organizations do qualify for two and a half times average monthly salary uh, subject to that 25% percent or greater decline in revenues comp quarter over quarter. Uh, the last thing I will say is, as I indicated earlier, uh, Security National is deep in the throes of doing uh, the PPP loans. And we have invested in electronic portal where all of the application stage, all of the submittal of information stage, and everything is done electronically. We've been working diligently over the weekend and we already have 79 applications as of uh, 6 a.m. this morning that have been submitted to the SBA for hopefully approval of, the, uh, of their PPP loan request. I've more than taken my time, so uh, I will now uh, turn it back over to Anna to further the program. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for allowing Security National Bank to be a sponsor of these great uh, programs. We see a lot of benefit for our customers, the chamber members, and the community as a whole, and we are glad to be part of it. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much, Ray, to you and your team, and we look forward to having you on board as our sponsor for the rest of the series this year. So with that, I will hand it over to Kara. Awesome, thank you, Anna. And as Anna said, thank you, Ray, for supporting this toolkit program this year and for all of your tireless efforts of you and your team supporting the West Des Moines and wider community. We are very happy to have your support of this program. And everyone else, good morning and welcome. We haven't seen you at our other events this year. Happy New Year, happy 2021, we made it. I'm not sure if anybody kept track of how many times they heard the word unprecedented in 2020. It was more than a few times, right? And we may be in a new calendar year now, but we are still in COVID times with both challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. So today we really just wanna make sure the amazing businesses and leaders in our community are armed with as much information as possible that can help as we continually navigate the uncharted territory that lies ahead for this next year. So with us today are five incredible panelists that we are very lucky to have spending our morning with us. And they're here to share their perspectives and their expertise on how we best prepare to return to work in our next new normal. So we have Stephen Smith, who is Vice President of WPA, Work and People Analytics. We have Marsha Aldridge, Vice President of Shared Services at IMT Insurance. We have David Lido, President of Palmer Group. We have Brent Martis, VP and Chief Risk Officer at Salmon's Financial Group. And we have Rachel Wacker, Business Development Coordinator with the City of West Moines. So we are going to hear from all of these fantastic panelists in that order, starting with Stephen. And we'd love if we're just gonna dive right in, if you could speak to your strategies for returning to work. So things such as timeline, flexibility, the percentage of your workforce, remote, hybrid, entirely in person, 
new safety procedures and any other hurdles we may have ahead and how we best move forward in a way that is going to be good for both our businesses and our employees. Lots to talk about. So I will hand it over to you, Stephen. Awesome. Thanks. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> so I think the question essentially is, uh, is a regurgitation of the classic question. How do we best align our resources with where it matters most for the organization, right? And, and resources can mean a lot of things. It can mean uh, your tangible, intangible assets. It can mean your costs in terms of workspace. It can mean your people, place, and processes. And where it matters most can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people as well. Is it about culture? Is it about revenue? Is it about productivity? Is it about engagement? Um, and as a kind of quick caveat, my organization actually helps answer these questions for organizations all over uh, the states, uh, the country, and the globe. So my perspective and, and my little spiel this morning is going to be more of the high-level perspective of what we're seeing across all of our clients worldwide to give you more of that uh, 50,000 foot view. Of course, we could talk about details for any of our particular clients uh, in a follow-up or, or the FAQ section. Uh, but I think the important thing is to think about as you think across the entire world and how we're going to rebuild that new normal and all those key buzzwords that Nick doesn't want to hear right now and pivot to the next thing, it's really under, important to understand that we are on a continuum. We're on a scale. We're on a bell curve, right? So most of these organizations 80 plus percent are going to embrace some kind of hybrid flexible working scheme uh, like a bell curve would. Uh, on each tail you have the left side where a few people even here locally. Organizations who are non-essential workers are not embracing flexibility at all, not embracing hybrid working at all, and are going to remain throughout the pandemic last year and, and certainly through the future 100 percent on campus. You also have companies on the right tail. We have government agency that we worked with in DC who said, you know, because of technology and security, that's not something we're ever gonna be able to embrace. But as, uh, as the West Des Moines Chamber said this morning, after six months of having to work that way, we got a phone call and said, oh my God, it works. How do we rebuild it? So you're gonna see extremes either way. And again, you're gonna see approximately 70% of those organizations sitting somewhere in the middle, uh, embracing some kind of hybrid flexibility. Now, the question becomes, why would we do this? What are the reasons for embracing this new kind of working? And honestly, like I just said about the government agency that called us a few months ago, it works. We learned a lot of lessons when we went through this whole painful process. Thank God we did, right? We learned that, you know, maybe some of the things that we were doing in corporate America wasn't the best use of our time, right? How many times did we go home and realize we don't need to have that meeting? I don't need to send in that TPS report that no one's you know, looking at in the first place. We got a lot more efficient and effective with our time. We also learned that we became just you know, as productive and for some behaviors and for some tasks and roles, even more productive than we were in the office space. We also learned that there's a lot of cost savings that can be uh, realized with this. We, not only in terms of real estate, which I think is a large part of today's conversation, but even in terms, in, in, in terms of the, the toll that we're doing on mother nature with, with commuting times and, and all that jazz. We also learned that, you know, despite all of these positives, believe it or not, that we had, you know, are taken away, people still miss the office. They still miss each other. They still miss that social interaction. They still miss that culture. So we're gonna talk about that here in a second. But the second thing that we really learned was that there is a war on talents and embracing this world of flexibility is now gonna become table stakes. The world has now tasted what it feels like to be more flexible, more autonomous. They've tasted what it feels like to align their schedules with how it best fits their lives. Granted, when kids go back to school and babysitters become a real thing again, that's gonna be a lot easier, but we started to learn that there's a lot of good things happening. And push come to shove, if I'm a, I'm 33 years old, and if I'm looking for two jobs and all things being considered equal, one job gives me flexibility and the other one doesn't, guess which one I'm going to choose every time, right? I mean, and honestly, even our government agency who called us and said, you know, despite everything, it works, oh my God, they can now compete with talent for against Google and Amazon. They can start winning those smart kids that they want to win in the Virginia, D.C. area and all over the world now, because now I don't have to force you to come to our old antiquated office versus you know, the lifestyle you might live uh, with some of the other competition. 
So we're really starting to figure out that this world of flexibility is going to become table stakes. So no matter what your decision is, and we'll talk about where that might fall on that bell curve, the reason you want to do this is in the future, kids like us are going to be demanding this. It is just going to be part of the table stakes now. So I really wanted to think about kind of high level uh, across all of our clients, what are the most successful ones and what are they doing to get there? And the first piece of advice is not to reverse engineer. Many organizations go make capital in, uh, improvements and they go make real estate solutions. And then they reverse engineer to find out how do the people and the culture fit that, right? They shove change management down your throat to make it work. This is the wrong side of the equation. You need to start with the left side of the equation, which is who are we? What are we doing? What is our culture? What makes us unique? What are our strategies for success? And once we clearly can define those now and in the future, now let's go create a space and a policy that really reinforces what it is to be us. So first and foremost, know thyself. Everybody started copying Google because they built, you know, free lunches and slides. Well, you shouldn't copy their outcomes. You should copy their processes. The processes were understand ourselves, right? They're a bunch of, you know, 20, 30 year old, you know, computer coders in Mountain View, California. That works for them. Follow the process and find out what works for you. You're probably in Des Moines, Iowa, if you're listening to this, and chances are the same kind of employee value proposition isn't quite as powerful as it might be in California. So really understand who you are and build something to support that. Uh, number two, we often find that on the back end of this, what our analytics are finding is that a lot of the behaviors, a lot of the tasks, a lot of the assignments, a lot of the roles are really well supported at home, right? If you're sending emails all day, if you're cranking out spreadsheets and doing analysis all day, the home environment's really supportive of that. For most of us that don't have, again, you know, kids to deal with and all that jazz, it provides a great place for acoustic visual privacy and a lot of focus. Now, there's a lot of behaviors that are going to help our organization move forward in the future, including that spontaneous collaboration, that brainstorming, that creative thought process that you can only get when you're in office together. Those are the types of behaviors and roles we want to make sure that we're building space for. So understand that, again, that we're going to try to build space not on three days on, two days off, not on two weeks on, two weeks off, but based on the types of work that we're doing and how best to support it. That's going to change my role and personality, y'all. So again, know thyself. Uh, the last thing that we're seeing in terms of solutions is that organizations that are starting to shed some of this eye space aren't just going to a fire sale to sell it to make more money. They're shedding some of that eye space to change it into better we space, better comedy space. These are the kind of accommodations that are going to make employees want to come to campus in the future. The second you try to make me come, I'm uh, maybe it's just me being a mischievous one that I am. The second you tell me I have to, I don't want to. But the second you leave it up to me and you build something that makes me want to come connect with my friends and my teammates, that's when you get an all-in engaged employee. So whenever you think about shedding some of that I space, maybe think about repurposing it in, in a we space that attracts and accommodates. So lastly, as I think about kind of the, the big abstract lesson for the abstract problem, which is how do we align resources and energy, it's kind of threefold. Number one, as we said, know yourself, do the kind of work to understand how you work, and then work forward versus reverse engineering. Number two, make sure that when you make this decision, you're considering all the three P's, the people, the place, and the processes. If you do any of these three in a silo and try to shove it together on the end, it'll never work right. Make sure those three are together. Uh, and lastly, as always, make sure you include your people in this decision. Make sure you include your people in this process. They are your lifeblood. And if you do, you will be able to measure what matters and have a successful solution for you and your organization. 10,000 foot view, happy to talk through details maybe a little bit later, but that's kind of what we're seeing uh, across the world from our perspectives. Awesome, Stephen, that's such good information. I love the suggestion of picking apart what makes your business your business. What's the work you do and analyzing it from there rather than hearing, you know, a business down the road is doing this, it's working well for them. Well, it's, it's deeper than that, it's more important. You need to dive into what's going to work for your individual employees and your business. So really good insight. Thank you so much for sharing today. 
And now, Marsha, we would love to hear your thoughts and insight next. Thanks for being here. Yes, thank you for having us. So I am going to talk a lot about what Stephen just said, but at a more tactical level of how we have implemented many of the things that he talked about. So if you want to go back in time, 10 months, we, I met with uh, one of my roundtables for HR and see some, some of my fellow people on the screen here. And we talked about this thing called COVID. And we, one member was, was, had a plan, was very serious about it. And we all thought he was crazy. Fast forward a couple of days, we are in a room considering how do we get employees out of the building? And if you know our headquarters, we built this brand new, beautiful campus in West Des Moines, just over by Jordan Creek Mall. And it has those collaborative spaces, we spaces, and uh, we, we love it. We just, we had only been there a year and we made the decision to send employees home on a Friday thinking, you know, it'll be a few days. And here we are 10 months later, still out in our homes. And um, we have put together several task forces over the last 10 months to really take a step back and look at, um, and we call it return to office because return to work for us implies that work's not being done and work is being done. Sometimes too much, there's gotta be this balance. And so we'll talk a lot about that here in the next few minutes about what is that balance? And we can only do IMT. Uh, my team's job is to look at the, the environment in which we're competing and look through what other companies are doing so that we can be a competitive uh, landscape for the people we're trying to attract. But we can't do what our friends across the street at Athene are doing. And we can't do what Wells Fargo or even the smaller companies. So we have to do what is best for IMT. And so we put together a couple of task forces and it's called return to office. And we have a number of employees that are involved in that. And then we have a flexibility task force as well. Both of those have uh, guiding principles and they rely heavily on our values for our company. Who are we and who were we before and who do we wanna to transform to be as we continue to move down this journey? Um, I think it was Nick doesn't like the buzzwords. Uh, we took those buzzwords and used them uh, in a positive way. Instead of saying unprecedented times, these are exciting times. We're being challenged to think of new ways to do work, new ways to do business, new ways to connect. And so we have taken that challenge and tried to make it uh, positive. Now in HR, we're very concerned with employee uh, well-being. So we have to balance not just what work is getting done, but how is the work getting done? So yes, I can sit in my home all day long. I don't have to commute, but I'll tell you, it's driving me crazy. And I don't have kids. I don't have anything distracting me, but I miss my friends. And so we want to keep that component in what is that meaningful experience for all employees across the board? So that was one of the things that we're thinking through. Um, we are going to do some level of um, change on the flexibility scale. We did put together a plan, but if I tell you what that plan is today, 30 days from now, 60 days from now, it's all going to be very different. And so one thing that we have done is just said, challenge ourselves. What are the paradigms that we had before of a corporate insurance company? Throw those out the window and think about what can be. We do know that we will offer some level of flexibility for those individuals that want to be in their homes part of the time, couple of days, three days, whatever that looks like. Um, we also know that we have employees that want to come back to the office. Steven, you said, don't tell you that you have to come back in. That is the approach we've taken. We've said, what do you want to do? When we implement our plan, we are going to do a survey to employees and say, what do you want to do? What is your ideal? How is, how is your work going to best get done and how does that align with the business? And so I'm gonna use that reverse psychology and say, you know what, you can't come back in because then they're all gonna flood back in, right? The other thing that we know and we have to keep in mind is the genie is out of the bottle. We know people can work from their homes and be happy doing it. We also know that there are some people that are emailing their bosses at night at eight o'clock or 10 o'clock. 
Now, there's two ways to look at that. It can be window work. So a couple hours you know, during the day, they had to do something and so now they're catching up. So that's great. But then the propensity also can be that those employees are working too much because it's too easy. I don't want that for my employees. So we are, when we look at our return to, to office and the flexibility approach, we're gonna keep that balance in mind. Right now, I have about 73% of my employee base is in West Des Moines at the home office. So I'm looking at accommodating 265 different uh, schedules, lifestyles, balances. Megan Bonenkamp, who is my uh, main, she does all the work. Uh, she's going to have the challenge of how do we recruit and retain the employees that we have, which will require embracing this new paradigm that work doesn't just get done in the office. We have um, a commitment in, in the communities in which, you know, in West Des Moines, uh, we have another office in Omaha. And so it's important that those employees do gather together and we have a, we have a commitment to make sure that um, we are contributing back to that community. So we will not, outside of the brand new building that we have just built, we know that we will not be on the far end of that bell curve that Stephen talked about where we are going to abandon infrastructure and go 100% remote from home. We just have a, a cultural um, balance where we feel like we get a lot of really great work done with people together. The hurdles that, um, that we're facing is how do we keep our employees safe? How do we tackle that business continuity, that balance that Stephen talked about, and how is that right in the best way for IMT? We believe in a culture of collaboration. If you've looked at any of our surveys, we were top workplace, and the main word that always comes up is family. And we get that because we are together, and we have events, and we have fun, and we, we love to host parties too. So when we get back to the office, we're going to host a uh, a West Des Moines chamber meeting so you guys can all see our beautiful building. Uh, as far as timeline goes, <clears throat> it's anybody's guess, right? Uh, we, we thought it was going to be last May and then July was the, was the, um, the timeline. Um, we will send out, a we will use a phased approach and we will let the employees choose. Um, we don't know what their personal situations are, and we want to make sure that we don't infringe on that. As long as we are looking at this hybrid model and, and work is getting done and we're still collaborating, then we're just allowing a lot of flexibility. Um, I thought we would be back to the office by now, and we're not. Um, I could guess, but I, I just, I, honestly, we, we did our flexibility plan, and I said, it looks great, but I don't know what's happening in the community and we watch numbers just like everybody else out there and uh, try to determine when is the best time. I think we're targeting summer just like everyone else. And if we can allow some employees back into our building before then we absolutely will. Right now we're at Essential only. There's about 10 of us that share that big beautiful office in West Des Moines. And there's gonna be some readjustment when we have our friends back. Um, I think that's it, Kara. Awesome, Marsha. I love it. I love that you focus on positivity with those buzzwords because there are so many of them, honestly, that came out of this last year. And I think gone are the times where you hear pivot and you think of, you know, that scene from Friends with Ross and the couch. <laughs> I think we're now all going to think of 2020. So I love the positivity and great point. It's it's not return to work, it's return to office because most businesses, they didn't miss a beat. They, they had to transition because there was no other choice and you have to keep serving your customers and your clients and, and move right ahead. So, and I know that IMT has done that very well. So thank you for being here and sharing with us, Marsha. And next up, we are going to hand things over to David Lido with Palmer Group. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Kara. Uh, thanks to you and the chamber for having me. And uh, thanks to my good friend, Ray Meister at Security National. Appreciate uh, you sponsoring the event. Um, you know, I uh, heard a lot of good things already. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to walk through some of the points that you asked about, uh, Kara. And 
and just give my take on it and, and what we did here. But, uh, you know, uh, back in March when this uh, all started unfolding, we, we went into this um, realizing every, every person's situation is unique and, uh, uh, and, and, and working towards trying to figure out how to, how to accommodate everybody's situation, which is really, really hard. So, um, so that, was the, that was the focus. And then on top of that, uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of clients uh, with hundreds and hundreds of temporaries uh, in the workforce uh, who all uh, were dealing with something different with their, um, with their places of work. So uh, we, uh, I'm really, really proud of the team uh, and the work they did to, uh, to communicate uh, effectively with uh, all the different uh, leaders and, and managers we work with. Uh, to accommodate uh, our our working uh, working temporaries and contractors in the field, so it was uh, quite a task back in March, and uh, we've uh, grown a lot a lot since then, and, and come a long way. Um, you know what we did is uh, again, like I said, everybody's situation was, was unique, so uh, we had did have a small group uh, that wanted to stay in the office, um, and so we let them do that, and and that was really uh, critical to to our success. Uh, in, in trying to handle things from the home base and, and definitely appreciated the, the five or six people that, 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 that did that. We implemented a bunch of new technology uh, like everybody else with the, the video and um, you know, Microsoft Teams and all that stuff that was newer to us and uh, kind of a big deal. So uh, then we uh, rolled out laptops and uh, in, a, in a quick order, put a new phone system in and it was, uh, it was fast and furious there for a while. Um, but it worked and it worked well. So we started opening the office back up to more people uh, late May or early June or so, um, I came back to the office, uh, I think the third week of May and have been here ever since. Uh, and uh, uh, love working from home, it was great. But uh, for me personally, I just need to be in the office uh, and focused and, and have that routine. And uh, like I said, everybody's situation is unique. Uh, we have really no, no set date. Um, we've uh, uh, offered it back to whoever wanted to volunteer to come back. Um, could and uh, we have about a third or so of our office uh, that as that is coming into the office uh, at least uh, a day or two a week. So uh, we're being extremely flexible uh, with that and and trying to take care of everybody's situations. Um, you know, when we talk about the flexibility and the importance of that. Um, you know, we're really focused on on results. I think Marsha said you know the return to the office, not return to work, and that's that's the strategy we have uh, used as well as is talking about. Uh, the physical location versus the, the work being done. And um, we've, uh, uh, our HR uh, manager put, it, put together a, a remote uh, employee plan uh, for those uh, situations that if you're gonna be working from home, what we expect, uh, we're trying to get an understanding of people's flexibility in their, uh, in their schedules and what they need to take care of their families and, and everything else. So um, percentage of uh, remote versus hybrid, you know, going forward. Uh, these uh, plans that we put together are going to help us through that. Uh, there could be some changes because everything seems to be in, involving, but I don't have a, an answer to that. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to guess most of our staff is going to want to be in the office at some point during the week, and we're going to uh, encourage that. Uh, we think that physical uh, presence, uh, meeting face to face, uh, and, and is going to be really important um, for the future. Uh, but we're going to offer complete uh, complete flexibility, and uh, I know there's some of my folks here on the on the line here trying to see what I'm going to say. I think so, so they'll they'll hear it from me uh, here as well. But uh, again, we're uh, we were an all office go, uh, before, and I never thought this would work, uh, but it has, and it's really opened my eyes to what people can do when they're determined, uh, when they're they're dedicated, when they're focused, uh, when they're motivated to uh, to succeed, and not only personally, but, but to help the, the greater company. And uh, we're an employee owned company. Uh, so everybody does have some stake and, and skin in the game here. And uh, I think it's really uh, helped us uh, through, uh, through this time. And, you know, we've had, we've had to encourage a couple people to come back that, uh, you know, maybe uh, it was just a little bit tougher for them to be successful at home. Uh, so we've had, you know, some of those discussions as well. Um, but uh, uh, we've uh, took this whole thing with a lot of, uh, a lot of grace and, and understanding what people are, are trying to deal with uh, and trying to understand their personal situation. So um, um, safety procedures you mentioned, we, uh, uh, when we, you know, uh, put the office back, we, we, uh, we put together a safety training. Uh, so anybody that was coming back uh, had to go through a, a presentation that our HR manager puts on um, uh, with details of what we expect. Um, and we have hand, you know, of course, the hand sanitizing stations, we've uh, purchased some industrial supplies to clean um, uh, 
all of our common areas. We have a, a cleaning crew that comes in every night. Um, you know, mask when you're away from your desk. Um, so you name it. We've we've tried to to really focus on on keeping the people that are in the office or coming into the office um, office safe. So um, we've had guests on a very limited basis. You know, we shut that down for quite a while and then have opened that back up on a limited basis. Um, and you know, it's pretty fun to have an in-person meeting. You never thought uh, or realized how um, how cool that was. All right, you know, the video thing is is great and all, and it's definitely served a purpose, but. There's nothing better than sitting across the table or uh, or having a having a discussion uh, in person. So, uh, I know I've uh, had missed that and, and enjoy doing that, and, and I think a lot of our folks uh, feel the same way. Uh, some of the other you know uh, hurdles, uh, you know the word culture was thrown around a lot, and, and uh, Paul McGriff's really proud of the culture that we've built over the uh, the past 20 plus years, and uh, we just have a great a great team, a great tenure. Uh, a great brand in the community and, and you know that culture is so so important um, we've had to figure out a, a new way you know our culture is still strong but it's different right so uh, so paying attention to that and a lot of that comes down to the the open communication for me and the other leaders uh, and then uh, and then all the way through the company and, and making sure everybody understands they do have a voice and and we want to hear what they have to say and, and, and how this whole situation is impacting them so uh, you know what you hear a lot is you know the mental health impact of this um, whole situation of the lockdowns is, is tremendous. And uh, we uh, certainly want to, uh, as a leadership team and as a company, focus on, on that as well and, and help people through whatever they're dealing with um, in their personal lives. So um, like I said, we, uh, we did put, to, uh, put together some uh, remote flexibility or remote employee uh, plans and agreements. And um, we uh, and this would not only just be for how we're dealing with things now, but we're trying to build for the future and, and what that looks like. And you know, when we onboard a new employee, um, you know, uh, we're doing a lot with our customers. We're, we're doing it uh, all virtually and, and we're putting them in, in homes and, and, uh, and that has worked. Uh, but when you think about that versus uh, having a new employee get, get integrated into your, your environment and your culture uh, with other people around them all day long, hearing voices, and it's just a, a, different, a different deal. So, uh, for us, we're really focused on starting new employees off in person in the office um, and, and getting that base set before we allow them uh, more flexibility to to work from home. So that's more of our long term, uh, long term plans. Um, you know, we have expectations uh, and we need to hold people accountable. If, if people can't prove they can do it at home, then then we have to have those discussions. And I think as business leaders, um, those discussions just need to happen uh, to ensure your company's success and to ensure the success of your employees. Um, we, uh, we talk about, you know, being available again, setting those expectations of, of what hours, uh, do you need some flexibility on? And so again, understanding each person's unique situation and, and if they need a couple hours during the middle of the day to take care of whatever it may be, uh, communicate that to your manager and we'll work around that. Uh, so we're, we're big on, on that and then making sure we're taking care of people. Uh, and then, you know, having that, um, you know, it's, it's been pretty fun to see, People working at their kitchen tables and all that, and kids running around and dogs and pets, and that's all been great. Uh, I think long long term, you know, that dedicated working space from home is going to be going to be pretty important. If if people are going to work from home, having that quiet space where you can have interactions with clients and uh, and the such is going to be is going to be pretty important. So, uh, and then equipment, you know, what what equipment our company is going to provide and what equipment they need to, to think about getting on their own. And so we've we've laid all that out for our employees and. I know some of our clients are doing uh, doing the same thing. So, um, so in a nutshell, it's just you know, um, no matter what you do as, as an employer, uh, it won't be perfect. Uh, there's going to be somebody that wants something different. Uh, but uh, you know, as we've heard from the other speakers, you can only be who you are, and and we're trying really hard to accommodate every every single person here at our company, and, and we're trying to help our our contract employees in the field with uh, all of their situations. So. Um, so that's it. I mean, that's uh, it's a. And Stephen mentioned the war on talent. It is. It is true. It's uh, the unemployment rates in Iowa are really, really low. Um, the uh, the workforce participation rate has gone down in the pandemic. There's a lot more people that have decided to maybe check out of the workforce for a little while. Uh, so uh, employers are, are definitely competing for talent. Where uh, we have really picked up here uh, at Palmer Group, uh, which we love to see and. We'll do whatever we can to take care of our clients and, and help uh, find candidates uh, great opportunities. So I uh, appreciate the time. Awesome. Thank you so much. I like that, you know, you admit that this is this is a new process and things might not be perfect. And I think employees, for the most part, would 
would understand that, but it's just doing what you can and keeping that that grace and understanding of everybody's different situations in mind as we navigate these times. And I also like that you said your culture is is still strong, but it's different because that shows that you're still prioritizing it. And again, I think everyone understands that everything looks different right now. And I think you just get creative and embrace this this new normal and we'll navigate through as we go. So thank you so much for sharing and being here. But thank you. Awesome. Well, Brent, I am excited to hear from you next. Let's give you the virtual mic. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I, I am actually sitting in our brand new building on Mill Civic Parkway. Uh, we've been in this building since November. We have all kinds of Wii space. Uh, that's one of the beautiful pieces of this building is there's Wii space all over. Uh, but as I like to call it today, it's, it's me space. Uh, it's all mine because I'm, I'm one of uh, less than 50 people that uh, comes into the building on a regular basis. So hopefully it'll get back to a Wii space at some point in time. I, I'm gonna take you way back uh, to, to get this started. Uh, back to March 8th, it, it was a Sunday. I was returning from my last maskless weekend getaway. I don't know if anybody else remembers what those are. Um, I struggle to remember what that was, but uh, I was returning from St. Louis and got a phone call about eight o'clock at night. We had two employees that were at a conference out in Boston at a hotel where there had been an outbreak of COVID. And the big question of the day was, what are we gonna do? Um, and as we sit here now on January 19th, that still continues to be one of the biggest questions every day. What are we going to do? Um, you know, we, we uh, business continuity um, uh, reports up through me. Uh, we had plans in place, you know, when the fire hits, when the floods hit, we, we have four locations in the Midwest. When the tornado hits, what are we going to do? Um, but uh, we really hadn't thought through what are you going to do when you have a pandemic that that's going to last well beyond a year. Um, wasn't uh, wasn't uh, in our script. So um, one of the things we've tried to do since the very beginning is is what we've called a, a North Star, actually a couple of them. Um, the first being anchored around ensuring that our work workforce and our work environment is, is safe and healthy. Uh, we do have critical on site employees that have to be in the building. And so limiting exposure to those uh, critical onsite employees has, has been a, a major goal of ours since, since day one. And that has caused us, sorry, Nick, to, to pivot uh, multiple times uh, over the last 10 months. The other mantra that we've thrown out there is that, that we're better together. We, we truly believe that we are better together at the end of the day. And so our goal all along has been uh, for a gradual return to office in a safe and phased approach. Uh, and that continues to be a goal. Uh, hopefully it's not a goal in 2022. Hopefully I can, I can check that off my list in 2021, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we had about 25% of our workforce that was in a permanent work from home uh, environment. And so we kind of felt we were on kind of the heavy end uh, of that. Um, and so that was helpful that we already had some pieces in place that we knew could could work from home. Uh, and certainly what we found in 2020 was that uh, the rest of us are, are pretty productive uh, when we're forced to, to work out of our homes. Uh, as David mentioned, we made a pretty big shift in technology uh, throughout 2020. Uh, pretty much anybody that has a, a, an office space in the building now has a laptop. Um, and going forward, uh, the other thing that it's allowed us to do is we, we do have a device uh, carry policy now. So Every night you're required to take your, your devices home with you. Um, that's something we had struggled to get put in place, uh, but it was pretty easy to get put in place when, when the pandemic first hit. Um, we operate two insurance companies uh, under the Salmon's Financial Group uh, name. Uh, we've got offices in Fargo, Sioux Falls, Chicago, and Des Moines, uh, each which has had their own challenges. Chicago has, has had some logistical challenges um, we have not had anybody in our Chicago office since uh, mid-March um, and not sure when we'll bring anybody back to that office because of some of those challenges. For the rest of us, um, you know, we started in, in May to, to try and figure out how were we gonna bring people back. Um, and we developed a four-phase plan and the first phase kicked in July 15th. 
You know, our goal is to bring about 25% of the employees back into the office. Um, we basically went to each area and said, you have X number of seats to fill. We had maps of every location, every floor. And we said in the first phase, these seats are gonna be filled. In the second phase, these seats will be filled. Um, and it was kind of a volunteer plus type approach where we said, if you wanna come back, we'll figure out how to get you back. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we got to get these seats filled if we're going to try and bring everybody back over four phases. So we brought the first group back in July, uh, went well, was successful, lasted about two weeks. Sorry, Nick, before we had to pivot. Um, you know, we started to see case counts increase in, in late July. Um, the other thing, you know, as, as Stephen said, you know, you think of that bell curve, we, we wanted to be in that 70%. You know, we didn't want to be an outlier either way. And one of the things we started to see was that um, in having people that um, were required, if you will, to be in the office was becoming a, an outlier uh, with what we are seeing here in, in Des Moines and in our other locations. And so we made the decision that in August, if you were in office, you could go home. If you were home, you could come in. Uh, and fortunately, you know, we went to all, all volunteer and we, we wound up again at about, at the, about that 25% level, uh, which we were comfortable with. We were spaced. We had social distancing protocols. We had masks. You had to have a mask when you were away from your desk. Uh, conference rooms were shut down, limited seating in our break areas and our soft seating areas. Uh, and so we had plenty of protocols in place. Again, if you remember back in August, one of the big concerns we had too was with PPE. Uh, did we have hand sanitizer? Did we have wipes? And, and that was a struggle for, for a while to get that. Fortunately, it's not today, uh, but it was for a while. Um, you know, as we, we made it through August, one of the things we said, you know, when, when kids go back to school, what's going to happen? And so we made a decision that we were going to kind of stay put uh, through the month of September. Um, at that time, we were still in our old offices in Des Moines. Um, and we kind of had to make a decision, what, what are we going to do? Are we going to bring another group back or are we going to kind of wait until our office building opened up in November? Uh, and we made the decision that we were going to hold put with our 25% our that were in the office and uh, see what happened. So unfortunately in October, we saw our Sioux Falls, Falls office cases rise uh, and we sent our non-critical people home in, in October in, in Sioux Falls. Uh, and then in Des Moines, as you remember, back in early November, uh, we saw case counts begin to spike in, in the metro area as well. And so three days after we moved into our beautiful brand new building, we sent everybody home, uh, except for about uh, 50 people here in, in the Des Moines office that are critical on site. And so we've been in that position now for um, the, the last two and a half months. Um, you know, one of the things we saw too, which, which was concerning to us is that we, we called it pandemic fatigue. You know, we started to see that the protocols we had put in place were not being followed. Um, we were able to contact trace uh, cases in our offices that were occurring back to protocols that were not being followed. Um, and so, you know, when we sent the folks home in Des Moines, um, when we sent them home in November, we made the decision we were gonna stay put through the end of the year. Uh, fortunately, uh, yesterday we just announced that um, we're bringing back that group effective February 17th. So if you were in the office in November, you will be invited back to the office February 17th. So that will get us back to about that 25% level. Um, and then we'll kind of go from there. We've told our employees, the rest of the employee base that we'll get back to them by the end of March with maybe what our plans are for the next step. Um, but again, you know, it'll be heavily dependent on, on what we see going on internally as, as well as externally. Um, you know, hurdles, I, I think the biggest hurdles remain, you know, how do we get our folks back in a safe manner? You know, vaccines are, are getting a lot of conversation. Uh, quite honestly, we've got two medical directors on staff, um, probably summer, fall, we've heard end of the year, you know, who knows when, when the vaccine is going to be readily available. And so, um, you know, our decisions probably won't be based solely on the availability of a vaccine, but that's something we're, we're certainly keeping in mind. Um, you know, the, the other thing is, is again, as, as Stephen started off with, is, is how do we provide future flexibility? Um, we understand that uh, we have been very successful. Uh, we had a very good year in 2020 with, with the majority of our employees working from home, uh, but long-term, that's not us. If you go back to we are better together, 
uh, how do we get our employees back in the office with understanding that we need to provide uh, flexibility to that group as well. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to work through now what that flexibility could look like uh, long term. So we're hopeful. Um, we still have a four phase plan. Unfortunately, we're on phase one D or E or F. Uh, someday we'll get to phase two, but um, we're still hopeful uh, that, that sometime here, hopefully in 2020, we'll, we'll get everybody back that wants to be back. So with that, Kara, I'll turn it back to you. Awesome. Well, there's a lot of letters that come in the alphabet after that, but hope you, hopefully you won't need to use those. <laughs> but I love the mantra, better together. That's That should be the theme of 2021. That's awesome. That's what we're working towards. So thank you so much for sharing. We will turn things over to Rachel next. Thank you to Rachel with the City of West Des Moines for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is a this is a great conversation and something within my role at the city that we are constantly um, having with our business partners throughout the city of West Des Moines. Um, part of what I do for the city is kind of serve as a business liaison to our community. And of course, for years now, workforce has always been that buzzword. Um, so, you know, every year we have um, what we, we conduct a survey, what we call the executive call survey. Um, and we visit with our employers to discuss any sorts of heartburns, pain points, opportunities that they might be um, experiencing over the year. Um, we were midway through that in 2020 when uh, COVID-19 impacted all of us. And um, it kind of, uh, it, it gave us an opportunity or it, it, at the moment we had to also pivot in our conversations to pull in some questions re, um, regarding COVID-19 as well as some of the civil unrest that we were experiencing over the summer as well. Um, of those that we we surveyed this year, had conversations with, everybody was very optimistic, which was really comforting to hear. Um, a majority of them did transition to a work from home, much like the panel has discussed. And um, the feedback from our employers was that they were sensing that productivity was, um, was the same, if not better, with them working from home. Um, so a lot of them, while this was a, a, a huge disruption, as far as business operations go, not a lot of them um, experienced major disruptions in the way they were conducting business. Um, so as we discuss a strategy for returning back to the office from um, kind of a community development standpoint, we were looking at opportunities to kind of um, recruit a remote workforce to the area. Um, a lot of our companies do have work from home policies in place, but are feeling like they wanna come back into an office setting. Um, but we also, in talking with our employers, identified that a lot of them were seeing opportunities to onboard people or uh, hire individuals from other parts of the country. Um, it, onboarding is very, very difficult when you do that, but um, it kind of really opens up a, a different talent pool than maybe what we were looking at before. Again, in my role, I'm constantly thinking about how can we get people to relocate to West Des Moines or to the Metro or to the state um, to, to take on these positions? And now it's more of how can I also uh, position the city of West Des Moines as a place where maybe somebody out in California um, would, I guess, experience maybe a little bit more of a, an economic benefit here. Um, we are not like California, much like what Stephen was saying earlier, and, and, and that's in some really great ways. So we're, we're starting as a city to consider what can we do to, um, to position ourselves and make ourselves a desirable location for a remote workforce from other parts of the country. So quality of life, I think, is going to be a really big um, push on our end to um, help enhance a person's lifestyle while they are working from home, because we're seeing that maybe there is a bit of a balance there. Um, another thing, uh, an obstacle I would, I would probably consider it is, is childcare at the moment, because 
we, we are balancing children at home or online learning. Um, we're, we're going to be facing another summer, probably still experiencing a, a, a pandemic as well. And what, what do we do with the children while we're, we're working? So I think also we're kind of at in the beginning planning phases of what, what does childcare look like for the future to, to help to support our workforce in the city of West Des Moines. So yeah, I, beyond that, I mean, it, everything's been covered and I feel like I just kind of echo the sentiments that our, our business community has, has presented. We do, um, we will, so that the survey that I was mentioning, we will have a report that's generated on that. That'll be coming out at the end of the month that I would like to share with everyone. Again, these are these questions that we ask really help us to kind of um, shape new policy and new programs that might help support our business community as, as they navigate what, um, what the future looks like in, in managing um, business during a pandemic. Awesome, thank you. We'll have to definitely get that report out there. That'd be really interesting to share with the, the wider community. So thank you, thank you for sharing. I know there's a lot of layers to this and we have covered a lot, but I would love to open it up to Q&A now. We've got a little time left. So go ahead and throw any questions that you have in the chat, but I have one I wanna kick off with. Marsha, I know you mentioned that you have a flexibility task force. I wanna see if you can share a little bit more about what that looks like. I'm assuming it was something that was born out of COVID, uh, but can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yes. Um, so when we first uh, started trying to figure out, okay, how do we get people back in? Because there's this emotional transition. It's not just as easy as saying, okay, come back in after several months of getting used to this routine. Uh, and that task force um, was predominantly HR, uh, the building person, our legal counsel, um, just from a business perspective. And then when we started talking about, you know, six, nine, not nine, four, five, six months into it, we started talking about flexibility. We decided or discovered, what does that even look like? We, we the couple of people that are sitting here talking about it, our perspective is very different than the employee base. And so, and the managers, the ones that have the leaders, the ones that have to actually carry this out day to day within their teams. So what we did was we went to our leadership team and said, we need to think through this, at least put something in place right now, some skeleton plan that we can go from that's different than what we've ever thought. Because quite honestly, though, we have remote employees. It was born out of the uh, necessity of the job. So the claims adjusters and the loss control individuals, we never considered it much for our uh, home office base because, well, we have to be together to do that job. Underwriters can't do their job from their home. We know it can be done, but that's not who we are. And so we really started challenging the premise because you no longer could say these jobs can't be done from home because they are being done from home. E except for mailroom and our operations individuals, everything can be done from home, some level of success. So we asked uh, the managers to have some volunteers for this flexibility task force. And, and that that's what it is. It's a couple of us HR individuals and uh, four managers, three managers. And um, we put together, um, well, first, the senior leadership team um, threw out a, a, a base, right? They said, here are the things that you have to work from. Well, we kind of kicked all that apart because from their paradigm, they only were thinking about how we've done business in the past. And the leaders uh, from this team, there were 17 of them initially, they challenged all of those because they know their employees and how their employees get work done and the fact that we've been doing this for eight months. And so they really challenged uh, the parameters that the senior leadership team put in. They did a bunch of homework and they came back and said, here's what you said. How about we do it this way? We think this will be a little more flexible and engaging for our employee base. Let us manage this. Let the employees, we're trusting them today. Let's continue to trust them. 
And so we did put together a preliminary structure of what does this look like for 100% work from home? How many will we consider? What does this look for like for intermittent? So scheduling a couple of days a week, two, three days, I'm in the office part-time and I'm out of the office part-time. What if I need, um, I had a situation this summer where I needed to go home, my family's in Oregon and I had to be out there for six weeks, quarantine and then taking care of my parents. I worked the entire time. What if my employee has a situation like that? Is that okay? And so we built in uh, those base parameters that we're going to consider as we start getting back to the office. We could roll this out today and the team is ready to, they're pretty excited about their work. But honestly, I just feel like there are so uh, many things that could change in the next several months that I feel like the plan itself could change. So I don't want to roll something out that's a policy or here's the structure of it and here's the manager's toolkit when three months from now we may have a very different view. So much has changed in the last 10 months. I never would have believed that we would be considering some of the things that we're considering and having individuals so productive from home. The other thing, uh, Kara, that our flexible group has, is very important. So I, I read articles and I hear people talk about, oh, people are more productive and it's so great. We really have to consider that work-life balance. It is so easy to overwork at home and I don't wanna see the burnout. I don't want employees to feel like that's the expectation is that there is no separation between work and home. And so in our flexible plan, it'll, it'll cover the the technology and the, um, you know, the privacy and how do you uh, carry your laptop back and forth and keep it safe? But how do you take care of yourself? How do you take care of yourself and your family? Uh, the INT family is important, but so is whatever world that you have that you live in that is the base of, of your days. That is absolutely has to be a balance. That's a really good point because I think we've heard a lot about fatigue just from you know, specifically from the the pandemic, from from Zoom fatigue, you hear about there's there's oh. a lot of fatigue that is real in our lives right now. So we're probably more prone to burnout than ever. So that's very important to keep that in mind for employees, so that we make sure to keep them long after the COVID days are behind us. So right. thank you for elaborating on that. We've got some awesome questions coming through to the chat. This next one is for any of the panelists that want to unmute themselves and jump in on this one. How has your company's approach to leadership and leadership training evolved as a result of working from home? Who would like to touch on this? I'll jump in. Awesome. So leadership's a really big part of this whole thing as everybody just anecdotally has felt and knows. You know, some of the problems that we saw, even with organizations that went completely open office before pre-pandemic, thinking about you, Principal, what we had in challenges was when we lost everybody and, and we didn't have everybody in an organized system, we didn't have regular setups and check-ins. What happened was we quickly realized that a lot of our leadership was used to measuring performance based on butts and chairs. And we've heard a little bit of that today. If I see you here, I at least know that there's some culture. I'm sure we're doing some working. But when you can't see people, that all goes away. And now all of a sudden we have a very big breakdown between performance and leadership. And now we have all the challenges that we, again, have anecdotally all felt in the last couple months. So it's really important, first and foremost, that you arm leaders with objective information on how to measure outcomes. Once we understand what we're actually doing and the outcomes that we expect, those conversations actually become a whole lot easier. And it's honestly just piggybacking on the things that we should have already been doing in the beginning. But I think first and foremost, the big picture about leadership, especially in a virtual world, is understanding those outcomes. And then largely, as we talk about kind of building the space back to find our culture, that's when we start to think about when does space uh, and policy really reinforce that kind of human connection versus just the, the rote measurements of outcomes. But first and foremost, you need to know what people are doing. Uh, you know, as I kind of see a lot of these questions coming through that are all very good. 
we have to use analyses to understand what are our different teams doing, because it's not all the same as we all mentioned. Behaviors aren't the same, job tasks aren't the same, outcomes that are expected aren't the same. Uh, the level of, of uh, need in terms of knowledge transfer, all of those things vary between your departments and your personalities. And if you don't know what those are, you're never gonna be able to manage what you can't measure. So make sure that you're getting the correct measurements, you're understanding the 80-20 rule, right? Um, and make sure that you're measuring the right outcomes. Awesome, thank you. Great insight. Marsha, I saw you unmuted yourself. Did you wanna add something? Yeah, I think um, for us, the leadership um, transition has really evolved. Um, Stephen talked about, I can see you, it's really measured on, you're here at work, you were on time, I see you at your desk, that everything's okay. The, the focus now, the burden has come to the, the supervisors and the managers to work in a very different way. How do I know that you are um, being productive? Now, if the work's not getting on, done, eventually down the line, I'll know that. But more importantly, um, one of our um, guiding principles at IMT, we talked about this a little bit, is the family and the trust. And so um, I'm going to trust, but I also have uh, the importance is more on the manager to have IMT connects to find out how are you doing? It, how, how, um, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Is this working for you? We're having connectivity issues? So that burden, you can't just pop out of your office and have a conversation. You now have to be on Zoom all the time, purposefully having these conversations. So the burden has been falling more to our managers as this cascades down to know what and feel good about what their teams are doing. And so we have recognized that and <clears throat> uh, celebrated their roles even more because they're, think about this in the terms of the healthcare system. And I know this is a little bit of a stretch, but there are heroes right now. From where I'm sitting as my manager, 17 manager base, and then it goes down from there, I've got about 45 managers. I don't know what's happening out there. I have to trust that each and every one of them is cascading that and doing what is possible. And so we really rely on that, but also celebrate them being the heroes of pulling all of this off along with the employee teams. So in the last 10 months, we have, um, done two things, celebrated more, tried to find ways, just like I, I know I've seen out there on Facebook, some of the things the companies have done with the um, parking lot lunches and the um, Halloween parades. We've tried to incorporate so many of those things into our day so that we can continue to celebrate those employees and especially the managers that are helping pull this off. Awesome, thank you, Marcia. very important. Um, David, would you like to add something? Uh, sure. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, when it comes to leadership development, um, I would say 2020 was a was a year of, of development uh, that you can't get from a textbook, you can't get from a classroom, you can't get from a consultant. Uh, and I, I think, um, you know, personally, our, our team has grown uh, so much. Uh, and, and it's amazing what you can do when you're, and you're put to the fire. Uh, and, and you have to figure out uh, on the fly what, what to do, you make decisions faster, you focus on what matters, uh, and that's taking care of your people. Uh, we talked a lot about controlling what you can control, and that's taking care of your families, taking care of yourself, and that's your attitude and your and your effort. And we talk a lot about that as a, as a group. Uh, you know, our leadership team here at Palmer Group, we meet uh, as a group every week, and we talk a lot about having open and honest discussions uh, with with our staff, and that's something we've we've done from day one. But uh, you really do have to dig in and, and have those uh, those dialogues to understand what what's going on uh, with them and, and their situation and how you can, how you can help them. If you don't uh, get the response you need, it's really hard to, to, to guess uh, what they need to improve or what they need to take care of themselves or the families or, or how you can make them more successful in their job. So, um, you know, the leadership development we got this year was, was unlike uh, anything we've ever uh, experienced or maybe wanted, uh, but, uh, but it's going to make us stronger going forward. And in that level of trust, um, uh, which you heard is, is, um, has to be there. Uh, you got to trust and you got to verify, uh, to the data that Steven talked about. So, uh, so that's the, uh, that's what I would have to say about that. I love that non-textbook lessons for sure. <laughs> thank you. Um, 
Thank you to all three of you who shared. We've got another one. We touched briefly, um, Rachel mentioned childcare. So we've got a question that came through. And again, for any of the panelists that wants to um, voice their opinion on this, do you think childcare will be a new trend at businesses? Will that be incorporated as potentially a new benefit? Maybe a doggy daycare too? What are your thoughts on that and where that's heading? Um, I, I'll start and I, I can't speak for any particular business, but I think the conversations that I've been hearing are still very much in a planning phase or in a self-awareness or identification phase of do we want to be the child care provider for our employees? So I think it's it's um, the jury is still out on where that will go as far as um, as our business community goes. But again, it's, it's, it's having that flexibility within your, your schedule because it, it's necessary right now. And we, we're so used to, I mean, I'm a I'm single mother, I rely on childcare, but it, before it was, very, um, it was very structured and consistent. I knew when I was dropping my kids off and picking them up and now it's, I might need a few hours here and there, and maybe it's after hours or that sort of thing. So I think it's these conversations of childcare just starting um, for all of us. And, and we're just kind of trying to identify what, what the potential is there, what the opportunity is. Awesome, thanks, Rachel. And Stephen, did you wanna add something? Yeah, but at the risk of sounding like a broken record, um, this goes back to the Google thing, right? Uh, I think, some organizations are doing free beer Friday, and that's great. That might really work for their people, or it might not. I think we oftentimes reverse engineer. We either follow a trend or we throw something out there to see what sticks. And then we reverse engineer. And I love iterative processes. I'm a military brat. The OODA loop is what I was raised on. Having said that, though, got to know yourself. You are not, you know, 20-year-olds in California. You are not 40-year-olds in New York. You are not you are you and every one of our organizations here are a unique thumbprint and if you don't understand all of those things up front you're almost pre-damning yourself to having to go back and rebuild re rebuild the plan rebuild the space uh, versus making that iterative loop up front versus reverse engineer so you know we will get through this pandemic and in that time child care might not be as much of an important issue as it is certainly right today now uh, but I always am fearful of organizations committing to plans that will take them into the future only to have the first day roll out and realize we don't need that anymore, right? So knowing who you are today, um, building some predictive analytics to know where you're going and what matters most to you and your people now in the future will help you really hit that moving target versus kind of feeling like you're shooting in the dark sometimes, which I think a lot of us do. Awesome. Yeah, we've definitely talked a lot about how times are continually evolving. So thank you for sharing on that. We've got another question we will move to again for any of the panelists. For jobs or industries that are imperative for a transfer of knowledge to help someone's career, what are you finding? Is it hard to do virtually? Or what have you set up to make sure it's at the same level as pre-COVID? Steven, you wanna kick things off? <laughs> <laughs> I see you're unmuted. <laughs> I'm a talker. I'll just leave it off. Yeah. Um, oh gosh, this is sound like a broken record again. Not all positions need to have the same type and level and amounts of job transfer, right? Uh, some organizations with knowledge workers and that kind of institutional knowledge is really, really important. Other skill sets, maybe not as much. And it's also personality based. So unless you're measuring and you're understanding the unique personas within your organization, whether that be working styles, knowledge, skills, and uh, abilities, and kind of that future uh, kind of strategy planning, it's gonna be really, really hard to take a one size fit all with this. Uh, so understanding what are those teams, what are those people, what are those roles, where this is really critical, and then building in some plans uh, versus others, I think is gonna be really critical. So. Uh, measuring what matters and matching it with the appropriate uh, prognosis. Awesome. Marsha, would you like to add something? Yeah, I think um, we haven't had this conversation specifically because we are optimistic and hopeful that we will be back together. 
I imagine, uh, I'll echo what Stephen said, some jobs uh, require a lot more knowledge transfer than others. And I feel like we have accounted for those within our organization that are that fall in that category and that are important. And those individuals are currently doing it over Zoom because that's the way that we have to do it right now. Um, but I could see in the future where we even open up partially, let's say we're not back to office completely, that um, we do have the opportunity for those individuals to come in and meet at the office in a, a spaced way with masks on. Um, the building is prepared for the eventual return of employees um, in that distance manner. So I, I would imagine if we have that come up, then we can be flexible and make sure that that's happening. Awesome. awesome, thank you. Anyone else want to add anything before we move to the next one, David? Yeah, I would just say, uh, you know, for the jobs we have here, it, it is harder. I mean, if you're not ingrained in, uh, in having people around you uh, where you can just, you know, we have an open bullpen environment. Uh, now everybody's seated apart, but you can still have those discussions uh, with folks. It's just, it's just harder if somebody's sitting at their home by themselves, they have to take that initiative to pick up the phone or, or dial somebody via video versus just looking up from their desk and asking a question. So, um, so I, I do think it's a lot harder. Um, it can be done though, uh, for sure. And then of course, you know, it depends on the industry. Uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, the industries, if you're manufacturing them, you have to be, you have to be there. And that's, um, it's just a whole different setting. But for us, uh, you know, we were really uh, uh, strongly encouraging people to be here as they get started in their, in their roles. And I do think it helps set that foundation. And then it also gets them ingrained in, and who we are as a company versus them sitting by themselves at home. Definitely. Thank you. And the science is, science is very clear on this long before COVID, by the way. Having a mentorship program is huge for this knowledge sharing. This is something we should have been doing already, by the way. Um, so it is harder now because I don't think a lot of us really had that in place. But the science is very, very clear on this. A mentorship program will dramatically increase your productivity and knowledge sharing. So think about that soon. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. All right. We've got another question about vaccines. Once everyone does start to transition back to the office, how do you think most businesses will handle this? Will there be any require requirements involved in that process? I'll, I'll jump in first here because this is something we've had some recent conversations on. Um, you know, we, we have had discussions on whether or not we would require it. And I think the answer for us is no. Um, similar to a flu vaccine, we don't require our employees to, to get the flu vaccine. We highly encourage them. Uh, over the last few years, we've found ways to, to offer the flu vaccine to employees that want it. Either it used to be in office, um, you know, during, during the day, we, we'd have a uh, a station set up where you could come in, get your flu vaccine, go back, go back to your desk. Um, last year it was all drive-through, uh, and so that's kind of what we're looking at. You know, will there be an opportunity at some point down the road to offer some sort of a, a drive-through type approach where um, we can offer the vaccine to the employees that want it? Um, but again, at this point, we we have no plans on requiring that our employees get vaccinated. Awesome. Thanks, Brent. David, yeah, so I, we're the, I mean, uh, it's so still so new, but uh, I do know companies are having serious discussions about requiring it. Uh, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that, how that goes. You know, at this, at this point, we're not, we're not going to either, uh, just as Brent said, uh, but it's, you know, so it's still so new. There's a lot, lot to be known and, and heard about and, and how the rollout happens and when people can actually get it and, and all that stuff. So, um, so that's, that's our stance for now. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, the other thing I'll throw out there too is that even when the vaccine does become widely available, we, we don't anticipate any major changes to our protocols. Uh, we think we'll continue to require masks, we'll continue to have you know, social distancing guidelines in place for some time after the vaccine has, has, been, has become widely available. So that's the other thing that we're, we're trying to uh, let our leaders know as well that you know, just because a vaccine becomes available, we're, we're not expecting major changes to our protocols. Awesome, good to know, thank you. All right, we've got another question on culture. 
So someone from ATW is asking uh, this question. They said they have been approached frequently to help organizations work on reestablishing work cultures as people return to their offices. Because like we've talked about, that has changed. How are you planning to address teams or individuals that could use some assistance with emotional intelligence, workplace behavior, et cetera? Who wants to guess what I would say? <laughs> uh, two things. Number one, again, you can't manage what you don't measure. Culture has become such a strong word and we've used it so many times today, but I guarantee you if I ask nine out of 10 people, how do you measure culture? I get blank looks. At best, they'll talk to me about an engagement survey, which is not culture. So to understand our work cultures and what that actually is and where it needs to go and how do we reinforce that and how do we build to that, you better make sure you actually know what it is because from your seat, it might be something very different than from someone else's seat, right? So manage what, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure. Uh, and number two, you have to break down the measurement by different persona groups to understand what are those needs. We are unique. There are a lot of commonalities as an organization, as an organizational culture. 80% uh, of us will fall into some level of average. There will be 20% of nuance. And if we don't understand that, you're going to miss it every time. And you can either write that off and that can be your 20% turnover for the year, or you can take the effort to understand those different personas and opportunities and build to them. Surprise. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else want to follow that up with any other comments, Marsha? Yeah, we have a, I have a team um, within my organization that is there for the managers. So we, we may not be able to measure culture uh, in number form, like we measure how many policies we have or the return on investment, but we sure know when our culture is missing. We know when, because IMT has such a strong culture, you can feel it and you can see it when something is not quite there. And the managers are, um, the leadership is right there with their teams. And so I have a team that is um, available and willing to talk with the individuals and find out you know, what is happening, what feels off, how can we help and put together, whether it's some kind of team building or suggestions on um, how to have conversations. So there's a lot of support that my team can give them and, and they have sent uh, reminders out to the leadership team that even though we're not in the home office and maybe I can't set up a, a training or a meeting right there within your department, we can still do it in other ways. So um, we are still very much alive and well when it comes to um, support for our teams and managers that way. Awesome. Thank you, Marsha. We've got one follow-up question. Um, Stephen, you touched on this. What are ways that you can measure culture? I know that you mentioned an employee engagement survey is not maybe the best route. So what are some suggestions that you think would be successful? Yeah, like the best places to work surveys and things like those measure individual constructs and how much you like or don't like things. How much do you like your boss? How much do you like your desk? How much do you like your pay? That's very different than the underlying values and beliefs of the organization. What are our ground rules? What are our stakes? So there are several uh, models out there that can actually measure culture. Uh, I use one at my organization uh, called the Competing Values Framework. Um, but there are several culture modules out there. Now, what's important is finding one that is usable. You know, I think a lot of great analytics out there, but sometimes these things are very, uh, they lack action on the back end, right? Uh, I have a best friend in the office. Oh, that's great, but I'm not throwing pizza parties every day. How do I make best friends in the office? So make sure that you find something that is scalable and actionable. And there are several of them out there. Uh, and again, I'm super happy to talk to anybody that's curious about specifics on how to do that. Um, but understanding those value, underlying values and beliefs of the organization is where you want to start. Perfect, thank you. Well, our next question, we're getting closer to 930, but I want to ask one that shifts from culture to community engagement, because I know this is something that can be included in a company's culture. So the question is, how are companies handling employee community engagement? Are you allowing continued volunteering? How do you continue to support the nonprofits 
but keep your employees safe? Great question. Who would like to touch on that? So I'll, I'll start here. It's, it's been a struggle, uh, to, to be honest. It's been a struggle for, for 10 months. Uh, Money is one thing. Uh, certainly, we continue to provide the financial port support to the nonprofits, um, which is good, and I'm, I'm sure they all appreciate that. But a big component of our um, community involvement is, is just that, getting involved with our employees, encouraging, encouraging them to go out and volunteer. And we, we've made a couple of changes um, since the pandemic started. Um, and the biggest one is probably we're, we're not specifically sponsoring those uh, opportunities. Um, we used to, you know, if a nonprofit said, hey, we need, you know, 15 people to help us with X, we'd, we'd go out to our employee base and say, hey, we need 15 of you to go help out here. Um, you know, we had some issues uh, where we did that early on and, and, and actually had some uh, minor outbreaks, if you will, because we had a, a team together. Um, and, you know, that was back when community spread was, was pretty rampant. And so, what we've done is we've we continue to encourage our employees to volunteer where they they feel comfortable doing that, um, and when opportunities come up, we we will, you know, let our employees know about those opportunities. But but we're not specifically um, sponsoring those uh, anymore, if you will. Again, the financial support is still there, um, but but we're struggling right now and trying to figure out what's what's the best way, the safest way to make sure that. Um, you know, we, we can provide some of that sweat equity, but uh, are, are keeping our employees safe at the same time. Awesome, thank you. And, and depending on the nonprofit, of course, you know, some of their dynamics look very different right now too. So their needs might have shifted more to needing that financial support. So that's amazing that you're still able to provide that support even when um, the safety and the in-person volunteering maybe is a little bit more limited than before. Uh, Marsha, would you like to add something? Yeah, we're similar to Brent in that it's been challenging, but we have continued to move forward with our um, contribution of employees. We have a care council that uh, aligns uh, the community events, and they are responsible for making sure that all the protocols calls are followed. So it's smaller teams. They need to have social distancing. They need to have the masks. Um, all of the items in place that we have in our office, they have to also emulate. And so we have been able to continue to have people volunteer to go out into the community. I know we had some food bank activity. Um, we had some blank uh, zoo because you could be outside helping clean things. So there were a number of things that we could continue to support as well as financially. Um, and then on top of that, we also encourage the employees uh, with their volunteer time and their volunteer days to find ways that they can contribute where they feel like it's best. Awesome. Thank you. So you mentioned CARES Council. Someone in the chat mentioned culture advisory team. These are all really great ideas. And I want to see if we can squeeze one final question in here and then we will wrap things up. We had this mentioned multiple times throughout the discussion, and it was on the topic of employees working longer hours. So the question is, have you experienced this and how are you accounting for it? Flex time, required time off, any other approaches? Love to hear real quick from someone on that. Uh, I have a, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of mentees in my short career, uh, and I've had some good mentors myself. Uh, I work with on the board of SHRM here in Iowa, and some of the things I always tell my kids, I say, because they're usually younger than me, even before the pandemic, figure out what they want you to do in 40 hours, learn how to do it in 20 hours, take 10 hours to better yourself, take the remaining 10 hours to give them something they didn't expect. So that's very biased because it comes from me, um, but I always encourage people to figure out what you want you to do in 40 and do it faster. That balance and that time and that sleep and that energy is super good for the organization. I think I always tell people, think of the last time you had the last great idea for your work, the last aha moment, the last light bulb moment. Where were you? Bet any of you as you're racking your brain right now, but none of you are at your desk. You're probably washing dishes, taking a shower, washing the car, you were doing laundry, you were talking to a kid, you were doing something else. So I think it's the leadership really setting the tone and creating the culture and the incentives that create that culture 
uh, and really reinforcing the idea and acknowledging the fact that some of our greatest moments and our greatest ahas come when we are balanced uh, and not at the desk. Awesome. Marsha, did you want to add something to that quick? Yeah, this one requires us to really um, put our money where our mouth is. So trust uh, and relationships are two of our values. They're the cornerstone of the IMT being a family. And so this requires actual conversation, finding out um, in your IMT Connect what is happening, what do you need? Do you have children at home? Do you need window work? So if I see, it used to be if I saw, and I'll use Megan again, I'll pick on her, she would be sending emails at eight o'clock at night and I would let her know, hey, I, I don't want you there. I want you home with your husband. I want you watching TV or working out, doing your thing. Leave IMT behind, you need that balance. And so we had a conversation that maybe earlier in the day, she had a couple hours where she needed to go do something with her um, family or take care of something else. And so when she was working at night, it was just that window work. She's still getting things done and it worked best for her schedule. It wasn't a burden. And so what we've done is had our leadership team, again, this has to cascade down to the, to the smaller teams and understand and know your people. What is it that they need? Do they have children at home? Do they alternate? One of my employees alternates uh, kid days. So one day, because they're, they're at home doing school, she's a first grader, and then she has an infant, she and her husband alternate between kid days. And so she schedules her Zoom meetings for a day that her husband has the kids. And so just knowing your employees, having those conversations and figuring out what is they need so that um, you can encourage and let them know that the, the norm and the standard is not for you to be putting in extra hours. But if you're working at eight o'clock at night, it might be okay. Comes back to that <laughs> flexibility conversation. Yeah, awesome. Well, there has been so much, so much great information. We are recording this as a reminder, if you want to revisit, if you want to pass this along to someone um, within your organization outside, there are so many takeaways to our businesses and organizations to make sure we're considering all of the different varying factors and preparing as much as possible during a time when we, we have no past playbook. So thank you so, so much to our sponsor, Security National Bank, to all of our panelists, Stephen, Marsha, David, Brent, Rachel, thank you for making today possible. And of course, thank you to everybody who joined us here today. And we just wish you the absolute best in the year ahead. We'll make 2021 a good one. So have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Great job, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.